Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike and tech-related questions. As ever, you can submit your questions down below in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible within the allotted time. Go. I still don't know what the allotted time is. Right, first question is from Peter Mann. They say, why are low gear ratios such a recent phenomenon? What was preventing earlier group sets from having massive dinner plate cassettes and long cage mechs? It seems odd that it took until the 2000s for bikes to be equipped with 33 plus teeth cassettes. Was it a macho thing that riders didn't want to be seen spinning or did they really not think about having longer chains to accommodate bigger cassettes? Uh, I'm going to throw it out there. I feel like tradition is one of these big things that's played a part. It's tradition, but yeah. it's also that rider that bikes were have been evolving and they continue to evolve, evolve yeah. and they continue to become more capable than what they were. And the demands of racing, uh, you know, back in the day in like the Merckx mm. era and the Copy era, didn't require those easy gears. I mean, yeah, they would have benefited from them, but they got they were able to ride up the hills that they were riding and racing on grind, with yeah. what they had. And the style was that you did sort of grind away and when they didn't have power meters in that era as well, there was no way of knowing that easier gears were better. The other thing is that they just weren't riding up hills back then like the, the Mortarolo, like the Zoncolon, like the Anglerou. They, they were riding on genuinely much sort of shallower climbs. I would say, yeah, shallower gradients. And also just the fact, I think, Pro riders in general are gradually slow to adopt new technologies. No one really like all leaps to a new thing at once. It's just gradually trickled in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is from Too Old for This. What a username. They say, Hi, GCN Tech Guru Dudes and Dudes. Don't know who those guys are. No, I don't know. They sound really cool. Um, often I hear you advising us mere mortals not to clamp our fancy pants carbon frames in our mechanic work stands but to only ever always use a seat post. Brill. But what about bike rack clamps on the top of the roof car? They only clamp onto the frame. They're about to move back to sunny England with the bike on the roof of their car, and they're a con bit concerned. What gives advice, please? Um, so most bike racks that I've had experience using yeah. tend to clamp uh, from like the dropouts. Yeah, I've seen lots of like that. And then they have just kind of like an arm that comes up that maybe holds the down tube, but yeah. it's not holding, it's not clamping the down tube with no. force. It's just kind of like, just sort of holding it in place. And so that's generally sort of okay. That's I what think. I was gonna say. So I think go back a number of years, and I think you did see roof racks that really did clamp onto the frame. Cause I remember being a kid and I think maybe I had my first carbon fiber frame and the, the the bike shop when they sold it to me actually I think it was one of my first sponsored bikes actually yeah was like do not put this in the roof rack you're going to crush the frame yeah but that, that's because maybe a lot of older roof rack designs are based around like cheaper um, steel or aluminium bikes yeah. that can be clamped you generally you can clamp sort of steel and aluminium tubes in that way you still have to be careful about yeah. crushing those like you wouldn't want to put them in a vice but like yeah there's I would say there are plenty of roof rack options out there that are safe for carbon bikes. Just, you know, have a look. I'm and... totally with you on what you said. I think modern clamps secure the bike and clamp onto themselves just to hold the bike in place. Yeah. So yeah, cool. Uh, you tell me 18. 18. He says, <laughs> hi, I've purchased a Bianchi Via Neroni 7 uh, with 105. However, the crank is the only part that's not Shimano 105. It's Shimano FC hyphen RS510. Though I like this bike, uh, it's false advertising to call it 105 when it completely isn't 105. Yeah, I disagree. I, you can't say that's false advertising, no, I, I feel. I think it is. Because you can see what it, like, when you buy the bike, you can see what it is. You've got has, to do a bit of research. It has the list of the components when you buy the bike. You can see what you're getting. Yeah. Um, I can see the where, I can kind of see where they're coming from, that it might seem slightly misleading if you're perhaps not clued up about this stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a common thing. It used to be a lot more common, and then bike journalists, when they were reviewing bikes, often started criticising bikes for this. Mm. Uh, and so we started to see a lot more complete group sets fitted to bikes when you bought them. But there was this thing where you'd often get like a complete group set, apart from like stocking filler brakes and some like lower spec unbranded chain set. Yeah. It's quite a common. I remember seeing it where bikes would just come with a, a spec up rear derailleur 
and then yeah. it would make it look like it was a bit bit better. But sometimes there's an actual genuine reason why they're doing it. So for example, like say Cannondale, for example, yeah. they were all about 30 mil spindles. So you can't fit a Shimano chain set Good because point. it's a 24 mil spindle on the axle of the chain set. So they created their own uh, chain sets, uh, which were actually like really, really light and really good. And in you know, many people would consider those an upgrade over a Shimano yeah. chain set. So, yeah. like you know, it's not always it's not always bad. No, I mean the important takeaway: check the spec sheet of the bike that you're going to buy. Hmm. Um, next question is from Eddie Spiby. Speedy. They say, I'm wanting to get some new tires for my bike. The issue I'm having is there is a tight tolerance in their frame. Is there somewhere that I can put in the wheel make that I'm using and the model of the bike along with the tire brand to see how big it will blow up to? Yes. So, wow. well, Pirelli. Yeah. So a lot of brands are, are quite, yeah. I think there's a lot of tire brands out there whose tires balloon up massive and, yeah. and are definitely bigger than what they're saying they are. Pirelli's seem to be very true to size and they do have a handy tire size guide on their site that you can look at. So they will basically say if their 26 mil tire is fitted to a wheel rim that has a 19 mil internal width, yeah. it will be 26 millimeters. Yeah. Uh, uh, whereas, but they have uh, uh, charts on there that say if it's fitted to say a 23 mil rim or a 17 it's gonna mil, measure a wider. it will tell you what the tire will come out at so you can consult that. Yeah. I was going to say exactly the same as you. Yeah, there you go. fantastic. Tom Wilson, what's he got to say? Uh, hi all, I have a recurring problem when racing on the turbo. Mm -hmm. When I get out of the saddle to sprint or climb, the floor mat raises in the middle and I can start hitting the pedals. What? Um, I've got a Wahoo kicker with rocker feet and the Wahoo floor mat on a wooden floor. I've tried putting 16 <laughs> kilogram dumbbells on either side of the mat, but this still happened. Any suggestion on how to fix this? I mean, I couldn't even lift 16 kilogram dumbbells to put them on the end of the mat. I've never heard of this problem, have you? No. Maybe he's just got an incredibly clean, well-polished floor. Yeah. Silicon spray on the That's floor. Just the mat is just sliding around um, like an ice rink. I was trying to think of some sort of constructive thing to say here, but I'm struggling. The, only, the first thing that comes to mind is no, I don't think. I, well, I don't think it's a great solution to the problem. It's just to cut the mat in the middle and have the two pieces overlap, and that way, they if it moves closer, they'll just overlap more instead of like rocking up in the middle. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's if you it's have an unusual problem. If anyone else has had this problem, let us know in the comments section. Yeah. Because we've never had it. This is a great reason why the like GCN Tech community is so great. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Jan Willem Kuhlenberg says probably a question for Ollie. If you ride out of the saddle and swing your bike, does that give more rolling resistance than keeping the bike steady? Well, I'll leave this one to you, shall I? Well, the answer is, in terms of rolling resistance, we don't know, right? No. But um, what you do find is that when you're riding out of the saddle and if you're like all over the bike and stuff, you don't tend to travel in a straighter line. So you're probably like going a small little turn. A little like S curve, you know, a little like sine wave. Yeah. So you're, you're probably um, uh, actually traveling a slightly longer distance. So it's probably less well, inefficient. Well, if you're you turning, in theory, you add in some different forces and resistance into the tire as well. Yeah. And well, just physiologically speaking, it's considered for most people to be less uh, physiologically efficient out of the saddle. Yeah. There are probably exceptions to this. Andrew Feather. Contador, Feather. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Um, most people are more efficient in the saddle. Um, and so, yeah, if you can climb in the saddle, then okay. it's always going to be better, really. Um, right, on to our final question for this week's Tech Clinic. It's from Stoppo R. Yeah. I think, yeah, Stoppo R. They're saying, what makes shifters and cassettes one by only or two by compatible? What will happen if I put Eagle Access rear derailleur and a got a whopping big 10 to 52 tooth cassette on the back and a force access front derailleur with a big two by force chain rings. Will it all work? Mm. No, it won't. I can tell you why it won't work because of the range of movement that is possible in the rear derailleur. So the movement that it has, can only, it can only go so far, it can only pivot back so far, it can only move forward so far. Now, if you're using a super wide range cassette, 
that means most or if not all of the movement of the lower cage where the pulley wheels are is taken up taking the slack because you've got such a wide range on the cassette now if you add in even more range and difference in chain length by changing the front chain rings and having two there isn't going to be the possibility of taking up the slack chain um, and that that's why if you run a two by setup you're far more limited in terms of using a wide range cassette because you don't need to yeah well that was easier what he said <laughs> yeah what, what i said all right um ollie's in complete agreement with that Fantastic. Um, we're going to get out of here. We're going to answer more questions in next week's GCN Tech Clinic. So please do keep submitting them in the comments section down below. Yeah, and we'll see you next time. Love right you. Then. Bye. Bye.